Hello, good afternoon. Today, our guest is Professor Robert Clickgard. Hello, Professor Clickgard. How are you doing? Uh, good afternoon, Lipton. Uh, you can call me Bob if you like. All right, I'll call you Bob then. So how are you doing, Bob? Very well, thanks. Yes. So, Bob, it's quite interesting that we're talking about culture because you told me to call you Bob. And I'm from Jamaica and you're an older person. So it's usually Mr., Miss, Doctor, Professor. We don't usually refer to older people by their first name. Right. Or you can call them uncle, right? Yeah, yes. But in my <laughs> culture, calling someone like yourself Bob is a big no-no. All right. Well, you can call me. You can call me professor. Then I don't like doctor unless I'm a surgeon or a dentist or a, something like that. So you can call me professor if you like. Yes, and this also reflects on the level of power distance in Western societies. So the absence of hierarch of hierarchies will facilitate innovation and growth, as we will eventually discuss. It's it's really not that serious. It's a simply issue with serious implications. That's how I look at it. Good point. Yes, because if, 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 if in one culture you refer to an older person as John by his first name, it suggests the absence of some form of stratification. Good point, yeah. Yes, I, I, when people are writing on power distance, this is an issue that they need to look at more deeply. Um, what you're saying, it is an issue we need to look at more deeply? Yes, when you're writing on culture. The, the naming issue, because this is, this is primarily unique to the West. So like one of my teachers some, some time ago, she said that in America, people re refer to adults by their first name and she was shocked. So it's a, it's a Western issue. In most places, <laughs> you don't refer to older people by their first name. I was struck when I was in, in France, how when people would greet the postman, they'd use the title, it's, you know, they, you know, uh, Monsieur le procureur or whatever for, for a prosecutor or whatever it might be, it was always the title that was very important. And I just spent a sabbatical in Bhutan, which is a very hierarchical culture, relentlessly polite. And even my closest colleagues could not call me by my first name, except for one person, former prime minister who was trained in the United States. And he actually enjoyed that. And he told me, you know, it's such a pleasure to be with you one-on-one, -on -one, because when I talk to other Bhutanese, they have to look up to me and speak to me in a certain way. And when I'm with the king, I have to look down. And so this is a chance to have an equal relationship. The role of different in society, quite an interesting topic. And let me give another example. So ministers of government. So in J Jamaica, ministers will have a title like honorable, the prime minister is most honorable. Jamaica was once under British rule, but beyond referring to a minister as honorable, there's a culture of deference. So it, the culture of deference has receded somewhat, but there was a point when ministers were like demigods. One journalist in an interview said, I worked in the government and PS, the permanent secretary, the PS is like a demigod. And I'm all, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, these... Uh these issues I think it was are, a famous go ahead yeah these issues are important to me because of innovation in terms of unproductive entrepreneurship according to David B Audrey Jamaica is in the top five in the world so in terms of innovation I am quite interested in the role of difference in society because a differential culture does not promote innovation you can also see this in business cultures within the same broad national culture. In a classic book called, called Corporate Cultures, T Terry Deal and uh, Alan Kennedy pointed out that there are really four big kinds of corporate cultures which depend on the task environment. So, for example, the most individualistic and informal was high stakes and, high, and quick feedback. So a venture capital company or somebody making quick investments had a very individualistic anti-hierarchical culture, whereas at the other extreme, where it was took a long time to get feedback and it was low stakes, then you had a relentlessly procedural and hierarchical culture. One extreme, though, was high stakes and low long time for feedback. That would be General Electric and companies like that, where they're making huge decisions. And in those cultures, corporate cultures, they do have a lot of deference. So a vice president walks in the room and people stand up. Whereas in the venture capital company, you know, they sit down. 
<laughs> so, mm. so it does depend on the task environment also. So if you go to a Jamaican high tech company or a Chinese high tech company, you may see a similar corporate culture and I'll, I'll wager they use their first names. Yes, tech culture is different. And uh, there's actual research showing that when countries become more affluent, there's actually an increase in, indiv in individualism. But back to your point about venture capital, Bob, there is actually an empirical study exploring the link between venture capital and individualism and individualistic cultures are more likely to have venture capital funds. Mm -hmm. Well, these things are, it's true. There's a, there's a co-determination though. If you look at Chinese young people's culture or business culture compared to 20 or 30 years ago, vast change. So the, uh, these things do change. The, the trick is they don't normally change because of public policy, because we say we need to change our culture. That's very hard to do. And yet all around us, we note cultures changing radically. It's hard to change culture using public policy if you're not a dictator. So Lee Kuan Yew, my God, you were so hilarious. Lee Kuan Yew actually told men in Singapore to marry smart women so that their children would in inherit high levels of intelligence. But beyond Lee Kuan Yew, most people are unable to, to use public policy to change culture at the micro level. Mm -hmm. And even if you look at the data on Singapore's cultural variables, for example, the hierarchy and individualism, they're very low on individualism and they're very high on hierarchy and collectivism. So and all, they're outliers on all the correlations between cultural variables like those and development outcomes. So he didn't change that culture. And indeed his effort to try to get selective breeding through incentives actually fell apart after a while. And so now the Singaporean government is trying to get people to propagate by providing lots and lots of family benefits especially working on the women who are highly educated. Singapore is similar to the example of Japan. The Singaporeans, like the Japanese before them, adopted Western culture and institutions without changing the unique nature of their own culture. So there's a writer, his name is John Davidan. He's, he's a professor at, of history at Hawaii, at Hawaii Pacific University. So I am familiar with the story of Fukuzawa Yukichi. So Fukuzawa Yukichi was a Japanese intellectual who traveled and because of his tra travels, he was inspired to create new Japan. So Fukuzawa Yukichi did not lead Japan, but he built universities, he was an intellectual. And under his watch, the Japanese started to appropriate Western culture, the institution, the civil law, etc. I'm sure you're familiar with the story. But what Davidan notes in his article is that even though the Japanese became more successful, the culture was still Japanese. They, they wanted to be like the West in terms of economic dominance, but they still remained Japanese. Yes. Yes, I think this is an important point. Yes. So this is, I think I, you, you read this book where I talked about a conversation with the King of Bhutan, who told me when he was 36 years old, he said, you know, my biggest problem is how do I open up the world, our world to outside science and culture? They just had the internet come in. They had free elections for the first time in 2006 and uh, free press at about the same time. How can I do that while still we are the only home of a particular kind of Mahayana Buddhism? How can we preserve our culture while opening up to the outside? And so we tried to think of examples. It's always good to look at examples. And he said, Japan, just what you said. He talked about a cousin of his who just gotten back from Japan. And it would run into somebody on the street who had a Mohawk haircut, who nonetheless greeted the Bhutanese man with a bow and a kind of a Bhutanese, <laughs> Bhutanese appropriate cultural gesture of, of, uh, of said Buddhist appropriate. And we talked about Bali as another possible example. The king mentioned Israel as another possible example. I don't know Israel, so I can't say. But that is a challenge. How do we both open up without letting the culture get swamped? Japan did it, but other cultures, you see, they look, they get McDonaldized very quickly and run over. I don't know if this has happened in Jamaica. I've never been there, but some Caribbean cultures are, you know, swamped by the tourists and the shopping malls and start to lose their identities. Don't you don't you think? Yes, J Jamaica is an unusual case study. So I live in Jamaica, so I'm in a position to comment on Jamaican affairs. Mm 
Jamaicans consume American popular culture. So Jay-Z, Beyonce, the Kardashians, Kanye West, Rihanna, all of Nicki Minaj, all of these people, their, their music and artworks are consumed by Jamaicans. Usually in terms of developmental policies, Jamaica is behind the curve. So it, the Jamaican government spent like, well, sorry, wrong word. But after creating the patent law during colonialism, over 160 years later, the law was actually amended. So in a sense, it's behind the technology and institutional curve. In the arena of corruption and some pro-business laws, the country is more receptive. But the problem with Jamaica is not really the propensity to appropriate foreign institutions, but the ability to design a culture that can legitimate growth. So the, the in long-term orientation, it is not known for long-term orientation and there's a positive relationship between long-term long -term orientation and economic freedom and entrepreneurship. When we discuss individualism, the culture is more embedded than autonomous. People are unlikely to deviate from the norm and it's still tribalistic. So the issue is not necessarily the inability to appropriate institutions, but the culture to legitimate these institutions. Interesting. Yes, that's, 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 that's a big problem. So markets, you can talk about markets and build pro-market institutions, but pro-market institutions prosper in high trust environments and Jamaica is a low trust environment. Yes, except except when they don't. I mean, there's a regularity there. You know, you were talking correlations of 0.5 and 0.6 with country level data. Within countries like the United States, we have some regions that are higher in trust and lower in trust. So we can do a little subnational analysis, and you can do that in some other countries that are multicultural, such as India or some big African countries. And there is this relationship, and yet still there are countries that are relatively low trust that are able to uh, institute. And that's a good word, institute, make institutions which are necessary. They're not sufficient, but they're necessary for good markets and good states. So it's not just having, not, not that you would ever say this, not just having a law that we will have elections or a policy that we will, quote, liberalize markets. It's also having a bunch of efficient public institutions which enable information to flow and people to make quality gradations and judgments uh, so that markets don't susceptible, aren't susceptible to adverse selection and other problems. Those are, uh, I think those are independent of, or at least not entirely tied to questions of trust. Even though I, I agree with you that trust is a certainly a valuable thing to have. Yes, East Asia is actually an interesting example. There is a paper on trust and social capital in East Asia and the writer is actually arguing that these countries did well despite not being known for high trust. And I think that the advantage of the East Asian model is a longer institutional history and comparative advantage in building bureaucracies. So when these factors are combined, they can mitigate the negative effects of low trust. Mm -hmm. The paper is titled Social Capital and Innovation in East Asia. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a lot of, not to disagree with you at all, there's a lot of variation within those countries. You know, the civil service as it was in Indonesia was very, very different from what it was in the British uh, colonies. And certainly this, there's a, there are studies of the Filipino system under the Spanish and then under the Americans and then today. So we have these different traditions that the Chinese tradition, of course, goes back where they had national examinations administered by a bureaucracy at the time of Charlemagne. So that's a long standing one, but you can't compare Cambodia or others at the bottom of the development barrel because their, uh, their tradition of bureaucracy is weak. So there's a tremendous amount of variation within the Asian, East Asian situation. All right, I'm happy that, you, that you're talking about Cam Cambodia. Yes, we, we can compare Cambodia to China. We can't even compare the institutional history of China to South Korea. But when we compare Asia as a region to other places, especially in Africa, Asian countries do have a long is institutional history. So there is yes. a paper by Peik on South Korea. And in this paper, he's basically 
investigating education in South Korea, in pre-colonial South Korea especially. So we can never underestimate the institutional history of Asian countries, even Vietnam, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look recently, the data should show that South Korea surpassed Japan in per capita income. And in 1960, uh, South Korea had the per capita income of Kenya. So despite its longer institutional history, uh, it was at the same level as measured by GDP per capita, which is a bad measure, I suppose, but still it's, the progress has not been uh, historically predetermined anyway in Korea. Yeah, institutional history is just one com component. Africa, African banking systems are underdeveloped. This is a frequent argument in the literature. And during my research on Africa, I discovered that prior to the colonial era, there, there was an absence of formal banks and limited liability companies. Africans are known for credit saving organizations like ISUSU. In Jamaica, this is known as partner and in other parts of the Caribbean, people refer to it, to, to it as SUSU. But these financial organizations did not scale to become large scale banks. And I have not done, a re I have not done serious research on the topic as yet, but I do believe that this is one reason why banks in Africa are underdeveloped. They're still behind the learning curve, but with more research and investments, they will eventually achieve parity with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, an, an old book of mine called Adjusting to Reality, originally from 1991, was just republished by Rutledge. And I have a, a story in a, one chapter about the emergence of credit systems in countries and talking about rotating savings and credit associations and other features like that. They really were around at a time when there was very low trust, as you said, and it was hard to keep your money away from your own kin. So if you put money, you had money around, somebody comes to you and says, you know, I need some money, you can't say no. So what they would do is they'd either buy cattle, so it was non-fungible, you couldn't cut off a hoof, or they'd have these credit the savings associations where everybody puts in something, but it, somebody's got it in a safe place. And so when you when somebody comes by, you just don't have the money until you get it once a year. And then the, the argument is that as institutions for grading and enforcing quality regulations more broadly across markets of various kinds, as these emerge with measurement, this is the theory of people like Douglas North, better measurement devices, suddenly institutions of the market begin to replace indigenous institutions like savings clubs, things where barter trade was mostly, uh, it was technological, it couldn't, tra couldn't travel very well, but it was also a way to avoid being cheated because you had repeat uh, transactions. It's a long argument and, and sort of historically interesting. I think you're right today, those are, those are not as important as what can we do if we're at a certain stage of our financial system development? How can we learn from other countries that move from, seven to 10 to 12 to 15 on the scale, what steps did they take to promote trust, to uh, limit corruption, and to get better information around to people about opportunities? Markets, again, markets and, imper and impersonal trust. The non-Western world also had the markets, but they were underpinned by tribalism and religion. For, for countries to scale, we need markets that are supported by impersonal trust. So I agree with you 100%. It's just that surprisingly, we have really great data on the topic, but not a book. So Joseph Henrich has an excellent book on the rise of the West, but we don't have a specific book looking at how impersonal, impersonal trust in the West fostered markets and, and comparing trust in the West to elsewhere. There, there's a book on the history of trust, but not a book dealing with trust and business formation and economic growth more broadly. Okay. Yeah, but uh, trust is a topic that I'm quite interested in. Professor Clickgard, mm -hmm. you are also known for corruption. What is the primary cause of corruption? Well, I prefer to say it this way. I'm known for anti-corruption. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's put it that way. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of different theories about corruption and, and almost ideologies about corruption. And the take I have, which is supposed to be arresting rather than complete, is that there aren't corrupt people, there are only corrupt institutions. And so the corrupt institutions are characterized by a combination of somebody having monopoly power over a good or service that you want, having the discretion 
to give you more or less of it or none at all, and lacking accountability in the sense that if that person decides to give you none, there's no accountability of that action. And so the argument is that whether we're in a rich country or a poor country, whether we're in Jamaica or Japan, if there's a combination of monopoly power plus discretion minus accountability, there's a temptation for corruption. And the second insight is that corruption is a crime of calculation, not of passion. So both the giver and the receiver of a bribe consider what the risks and rewards are. And those depend on the monopoly situation in part, but also depend on what the punishments are, and what the probability of being caught are. So that out of that little framework of monopoly plus discretion minus accountability, plus the incentives and information, the risk profile of various decisions, up come a whole series of prescriptions for improving procurement systems, tax systems, licenses and permits, uh, not so much the big high, uh, the, the grand corruption of a dictator, but the bureaucratic corruption. There are a lot of things that flow out of that. So that's been my theory. And then with lots of case studies in various parts of the world that show progress, sometimes failure or less, those lead to um, inspiration for people to uh, then take on the problem, which so often is blamed on culture. So often people say, oh my gosh, you know, Brazil, this is just a way of life here. Yesterday, I had a conference on the telephone with Mexico. And Mexico has, you know, literally the President Peña Nieto actually said in 2014, he suspects that the problem of corruption in Mexico is deeply cultural, which implied, you know, to him, that implied we really can't do much about it. And as you know, for me, that implies we have to take the cultural norms, values, and practices into account in the design and implementation of the policy because it's hard to change cultures, but it doesn't mean we just say, well, we've got a problem that has cultural correlates, therefore we can't do anything about it. Do regulations breed corruption? I had a final exam question on that when I was teaching at the Kennedy School. It said something just like that. And I had two quotes. One said, what we need to fight corruption in India is more regulations and control. And then there was a second quote saying, what we need to fight blah, 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 in some other country was less restrictions and controls. And I said, discuss. And the answer I wanted them to have was to use the formula I just gave you, which is corruption equals monopoly plus discretion minus accountability to see whether a regulation or a control would actually increase or reduce monopoly power, whether it would clarify and limit discretion or in fact make it higher by being such a mysterious rule or so many of them that no one can understand it except the official, and whether it would enhance accountability and reviewability and transparency or whether it would actually uh, occluded. And I think you can find cases in all three of those categ categories where a regulation can either increase or decrease the monopoly power of the official, can actually increase or decrease the discretion that she has, and can actually increase or decrease the accountability. And therefore, the prediction is that is unclear depending on, it depends on the situation. There is a paper, regulation and distrust, that's quite similar to what we're seeing regulations can breed more res more respects for other regulations that can lead to that can lead to corruption and social problems and i'm bringing up the issue of regulations because i am from jamaica and i think that one of the reasons why corruption is so pervasive is because of regulations in order to get simple projects done one has to consult too many people and then we must also fa factor into account the cost of the bureaucracy. If bureaucrats are not properly paid, there might be an incentive for them to be corrupt. So when we account for the, the burden of re regulation and the cost, for some people, it is reasonable to pay a bribe than to follow the rules. And for the bureaucrat, it also might be reasonable to accept the bribe than to follow the, 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 the customs that are against corruption. Exactly. It's, it's exactly a, a syndrome. So one of the features of many situations of, I'd say, especially of poor countries, poorer countries, <coughs> is an equilibrium of corruption, where neither the giver nor the receiver of the bribe believes that it's moral to give or receive the bribe. They, they, they really are doing it uh, charitably, I could say, doing it because they want to get their mom into the nursing home, and everybody has to pay a bribe to get it in there. And so you would lament it in the morning when you get up, you pay the bribe at noontime, you go home and have a, uh, a beer at night and you go, man, this is terrible to have a way of life like this. 
And that's all over the world. We have those equilibria. The good news is that there are, there are studies of collective action equilibria in many areas. And we know what the analytically what the features are of breaking open uh, such an equilibrium. I wrote a paper once called Subverting Corruption. And it's about the difference between prevention through limiting monopoly, clarifying discretion, and enhancing accountability to subverting corrupt systems, which looks a little bit like more the attack on organized crime and has a whole different set of principles. Organized, organized crime. There is a, a new book on crime. The, the, the author is arguing that we should decriminalize crime. And I've been looking at the issue. What do you think about crime? And by crime, I'm not referring to extremely serious crimes like murder or human trafficking, but petty crimes and drug-related crimes. Well, organized crime appears in two classic situations. One is speaking for a product, but we have a regulation or a law that proscribes that product. Think of drugs or gambling or prostitutes or something like that. So in societies where uh, they hope that by having the rules, they will extirpate the demand, and sometimes that happens. But oftentimes it just moves the market into a gray market or black market situation where organized crime can thrive. A more interesting case is not the market failure, but a government failure. When you have a situation where the government is very inefficient and maybe bribe strewn and you know all these problems, or maybe it's just after the breakdown of communism, let's say, as it happened in Russia, suddenly no one is there to enforce contracts. And in steps organized crime, whose comparative advantage in this case is not supplying a desired good, but supplying enforcement capability that is credible. And therefore the markets, the markets or the governance systems then are succumb to the protection money and the extra legal and with great inefficiency. And yet I think your point might be this, uh, one of your points might be this Lipton, that in some societies at certain points, it's very rational to pay the bribe. For every individual that's in it, and it may be rational for the officials to insist on a bribe. Their pay is so low and their situation is so parlous that, uh, as the Czechs used to say, he who doesn't steal from the state steals from his family. And so you get in a situation where it's an equilibrium. And then what we have to learn is that equilibrium can be awfully stable even as countries develop. And so we have to learn from it, it just doesn't automatically leave. So, with many other cases of non optimal equilibria, you've got to think of really strong strategies to bust up that equilibrium and then step in with better incentives and information flows. The book is titled The Social Order of the Underworld or Prison Gangs Govern the American Penal System. The writer is, is David Skarbek, a Brown University economist, and the article is published by, by Big Think, Should We Legalize Gangs? Interesting response. Let me, let me use the case study of Jamaica. So Jamaica is a small country with hundreds of gangs. And when the state is unable to contain violence and promote the rule of law, an oasis will be created for gangs. So some of these gangs, unfortunately, are aligned to political parties. There is the vexing issue of garrison politics in Jamaica. But today, the gangsters are financially independent. I just lost you. Oh, you just lost me, so I'll repeat the question. Yeah. I'll, 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 I will repeat you. the statement. Jamaica, so I, I'm, I'm talking about Jamaica, and I, earlier I listed the article, should we legalize gangs? Did you hear that? Yes, I heard the part about gangs also being aligned with political parties. Oh, in Jamaica so, oh, so, oh, so you heard yeah. most of it then. All right, then. So when the state is unable to promote law and order effectively, opportunities are created for criminal activities. Today, the gangs are financially independent. They don't need the politicians as much as they did in the past. However, the politicians still need them because they... They are they're powerful. They so they they're powerful and they can assist the politicians to, to solicit votes. Some of these gangs prey on businesses because business people are afraid and, and usually don't have enough trust in the police force, they're willing to pay the gangs. So at one point I said to myself, should we just legalize this? activity instead of 
punishing the extortionists, turn them into businessmen. But then I said, okay, what is the motivation behind crime? Who said that these criminals wanted to be formal businessmen? So this, this is my objection to legalizing gangs. I get the logic of the argument, but who said that criminals want to be in the formal economy? Well, gangs exist for several reasons. When you're very young and 15 and joining a gang, it may be for identity reasons. Uh, when you're older and running the gang or one of the top people, it's probably for financial reasons. Uh, there's a, sort of a, an artist's life type of reason also. You don't have to be uh, wearing your starch shirt at the bureaucracy. But there probably is a model that says that at some point these are economic activities. Then the question is, are these enterprises that we should go after or are there activities that we should go after? In other words, can we allow, let's take the limiting case, a social club could be a gang. Uh, and the other extreme, a uh, completely uh, vicious mafia organization has aspects of a, of a gang. So we might say we want the activities or we don't mind the activities which are socially benign or more or less benign, but we do mind the ones that start uh, intimidation, uh, start uh, extortion rackets, uh, start you know, getting, getting in the way of normal civil society and normal business and normal politics. So when, when you look at a case where they have gone after the, uh, the organized crime, such as studies of the mafia in Italy, especially in the early 90s where they had some success, or studies of Colombia when they went after the FARC, the, no, the political activist group, which though had a big element of kidnapping and drug running and so forth. And looking at the before and after of that and how they did that, you know, it's very difficult. The transition out of mafia life is a little bit like the transition out of guerrilla life. When you've been in a guerrilla warfare situation, you're, you're used to having guns. Think of South Sudan. They had all these people in independence, quote, independence movements, but they had their checkpoints where they would take protection money and they would take uh, parts of the goods that were going through and they had lots and lots of guns. So when South Sudan became independent, a big question was, what do we do with these or do we call them gangs or do we call them militias or whatever they are, but they're armed and they've been used to getting money in ways that an organized state says, nope, that's not what we want. So it's an interesting problem of what do you do with these folks? And there is a comparative study that was done at Rand a while back. Uh, I don't think it was particularly good. I don't think it was particularly insightful. I don't think this is a subject people have studied very carefully, it's, it, at least to my knowledge. We don't have a lot of comparative case studies, but I think the principles are ones that you've enunciated that the gang itself may not be the problem. It's the activities of the gang that we should look at and see what, to what extent we can enforce um, or encourage by incentives a behavior which is not socially pernicious. I, again, I am agree, I'm agreeing with you, but recently, I, well, not recently, like a few seconds ago, a thought was just originated in my mind, gangsters. If we formalize the security functions of gangs, clearly as economists, people like me and you, we're able to see how gangsters can capitalize on newer opportunities. However, this is a problem, Robert. The head gangster is basically a monopolist. He's a dictator. So a gang cannot be managed like an actual corporation. The culture is just too different. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't studied the management of gangs. I do know that authoritarian leaders often have a difficult time running their countries. You know, read The Emperor by Rupert Kuczynski, Kuczynski about uh, Haile Selassie or Paul Johnson's uh, wonderful history of the kings of England. I remember came, coming away from Johnson's book saying, who'd want to be king? <laughs> it's hard to run those places with you know, supposedly absolute authority. And same thing with, uh, with Haile Selassie. He had a difficult time with that, even though he was the lion of Judah, he had a difficult time keeping control. But anyway, getting back to the, the point about these uh, dictators, gangs, and so forth, a, a really interesting question for, for economists uh, like you is, what can we offer to the analysis of these things? And I think that we tend to have, not you, we tend to have these disciplinary um, knives out. Instead of saying, why don't we look at some good examples? Let's be almost like business schools professors and begin with the case method here. Are there good examples of cleaning up organized crime? Are there good examples of dictators who transitioned out of dictatorship into something else? And you know, the early 1990s, late 80s, what uh, Samuel Huntington called the third wave of democracy, 
was extraordinary in how many military leaders gave up being heads of state and had democratic elections. It was stunning. And how did that happen? It was partly that they were bad leaders and they had economic problems and they could get money for their countries if they had stepped down. But it was more than that, I think. I think these values of participatory democracy, which seems so Western to us until we see the long queues in South Africa for the elections when Nelson Mandela was up or the long queues in Afghanistan where people were threatened with getting their fingers cut off if they went to vote or strange places, you know, in Bhutan, very live democratic culture, even though it's only 10 or 15 years old. So I think we have these hopes that if people are given a chance to express themselves and allow expression, that we can avoid these military dictators in Myanmar. And you see people still today celebrating uh, the Asian New Year there and trying to come out and say, we don't want this. You know, we do have countries that are, have got tight, tight controls. We see a movement away from democracy in places like Turkey and Poland and so forth. But I, I still think that there's, there's hope here that we're not just talking, getting back to the theme of culture, that we're not just talking about a Western cultural idea here that people are opposed to corruption, even when corruption is culturally correlated with these variables, even in countries that are heavily corrupted, where there are collectivists, clan ties, and all these things we've talked about, organized crime, you won't find many Jamaicans who say, yeah, corruption's great, we like it. But you will find people who are wishing for the rule of law, wishing for more individual opportunities, wishing for a chance to express themselves in ways that are socially constructive. Uh, and I think that's the basis for hope uh, in the future. If you and I can provide more examples for them to inspire them, not to copy, but to inspire them to think constructively and not succumb to a kind of cultural fatalism, which uh, which I also see around the world. David Stasavage, he has a book on democracy. Remember, Robert, tribal societies also had many elections. So even though democracy is not practiced everywhere, we can draw on culture to support democracy in the future. It's easier to promote democracy than markets. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, because even in, in pre-colonial Botswana, the Asante Empire, Yoruba, and other places in Africa, there are examples of democratic institutions. So there's a stronger history of dem democratic institutions than formalized capitalistic markets. So it's usually, it's easier to, to promote democracy. And then when you're promoting democracy, you can, all, you can often link it to individual autonomy and freedom. Which people tend to like, especially young people. You know, on the question of culture and democracy, in my book, The Culture and Development Manifesto, I have a chapter with a lot of examples where culture was taken into account uh, and uh, shared experiences across different groups enabled more creative problem solving. And one of them is among so-called American Indian tribes. By the way, they like that term, most of them. So in Indian country, again, one of their terms, there's tremendous variation in the success of tribes. Some of them have minus 8% GDP growth, lots of alcoholism, very high employment. Others have 5% positive GDP per capita growth, and so forth. And so the economist Joe Kalt and, the, and an anthropologist slash social psychologist, Steve Cornell, studied these tribes and tried to figure out why they were more successful. And they ran the usual kinds of regressions, you know, are they close to important white centers? Or do they have natural resources and so forth? And they found tribes with exactly the same resource endowments that differed greatly in their success and in the way they were governed. And so they went back to wonderful studies that were done long ago under the aegis of the US government that characterized these societies before the acts in the 1930s that made all of them conform to a kind of tricameral you know, American democratic structure. And what they found was when the indigenous uh, polities of these tribes as documented in 1890, 1900 and so forth, had something like an independent judiciary, something like an elected succession of tribal leaders and so forth, something like a, 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 a representative council of elders that matched up with the tricameral structure more or less, this cultural match predicted the tribes that would do well in terms of uh, later democratization and later economic development. So their argument wasn't just that there was a superior or inferior culture there, that the culture variation had to be taken into account in understanding which tribes were doing well and which ones weren't. 
Excellent. So you, your book is actually in front of me, over 160 pages, and I will read all of it. I'm, I've been skimming through it, but I will eventually read all of it. I am guessing that it will be an easy read. But the, the, the study you're discussing, who wrote it? It's by uh, Joseph Kalt and Stephen Cornell. I believe it's in chapter eight of the book. Yeah, chapter eight of the book. No. Mm, that's, full, that's full of examples. Yeah. I, 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 well, Africa. Yes, Africa is, is always an interesting case study. But as I said earlier, although I'm going to complete your book, I've been skimming through it and I'm seeing many brilliant points. So you cited an old book comparing production in the Americas to East Asia. And the writer submitted that in East Asian countries, people valued punctuality. And this is one reason why they were more productive. So I've, yes. I've been skimming through the books. I'm seeing interesting details everywhere. But this, I have to pose this question, Robert. Why do institutional transplants often fail in developing countries? Why do institutional what plants? Transplants, transplants. Oh, transplants, yes. Well, the, the, ar the argument that Cornell and Colt make is they have to have a cultural fit. Now, cultural fit sounds a little deterministic to me. And I would say there are usually uh, different cultural norms in the same country, which in the same locality, which favor the reform and other cultural forces that do not. So let's take impartiality in bureaucratic service, you know, Weber's movement from uh, charismatic to traditional to bureaucratic cultures. And that movement you know, it seems like a cultural clash, but actually when they do careful studies within various places like India or South Sudan and other places, they find that bureaucrats both feel that they should provide impartial service and that they should favor their kin and clan. So they're stuck in a dueling set of cultural norms. This means if we want to implement in societies with those dual cultural norms that are in conflict, we have to create uh, structures and publicity campaigns and slogans that emphasize the cultural norm that's, that's consistent with the reform. And then structures that limit the ability of the other norm to interfere with choices. So for example, if you're in Tanzania and you're the head of the uh, teacher training school, they're a technical training school, and you're allowed to have discretion over 10% of the admits, you know what's going to happen. You're going to get people that influence you all the way. So I went, met a guy there. He said, I got rid of that. I had it all done by automatic, by a test, because that limits discretion. We go back to uh, the, the remarkable changes that were made in, in Lee Kuan Yew's Singapore. And one of them was the highlighting of the ideology of meritocracy, which, as we know, is very strong among Chinese people, not so strong among the 20% minority that are Malays or the 10% that are from India. But he elevated this to the way to enable opportunity for everybody despite class and other distinctions. Now, that's under fire now. And his son, who's the prime minister, has said we need something more like meritocracies in different ways so we can value people who are not just smart and get their book learning. But my point is that we are full of conflicting cultural norms in societies. In some societies, the norms for Protecting family, clan, kin, friends is so important that it gets in the way of modernization efforts in credit systems and in everything else. And so it's not, however, that we have to change those norms because they have conflicting norms, which look, look a lot like equal opportunity, fair treatment, impartiality. And we emphasize those, relate those to their religious beliefs, to their uh, legendary history, to their uh, leaders in the revolution who propounded those things, you know, those same ideals were there in many of the African leaders who got independence, the same ideals were there in the civil rights movement of the United States. And so if we can get the dueling norms in our campaigns for change, in, in the, way we, the way we market, the way we design, the way we uh, uh, involve people in them, and then figure out ways that we can limit the norms that are counter to those, and that's not easy, but we can do it through rules, automaticity, and so forth. Then, then I think we have a chance to make the norms uh, stick, the new norms, the new rules stick. And we can also use the education system as a platform 
to inculcate civic capital. Robust civic capital predicts that people are unsupportive of corruption. So in Jamaica, there are two parties, the JLP and the PMP, but the country is quite tribal. So people may downplay corruption when it occurs in their party and, def and even defend it in some instances. However, when the shoe is on the other foot, they rebuke the person who is accused of corruption. So one way to limit corruption by creating a broader civic culture would be to teach values and attitudes. So there's a book published by the Heart Trust and the Heart Trust is a training institution in Jamaica. And I have surveyed the book and the content is great, but unfortunately the subject matter is not disseminated in school. So one way to create a country that's corruption free or where corruption is limited would be to use the education system by disseminating that book in schools. But unfortunately, it, the, the, the values and attitudes is not taught. But the book published by the Heart Trust is an excellent book, a really great primer on values and attitudes. Interesting. So my experience, I, I'd like to read that book because my experience is much more pessimistic. You know, when I was in college, the hottest girls were the ones that went to the Catholic girls schools, you know, had all this moralization. And then once they got to college, man, forget it. <laughs> and, you know, the Panchasila program in Indonesia was an effort by the founders of that new country to create a, a common ideology across four time zones and, you know, 7,000 islands and all those different language groups. And so they had these five values that they drum into the heads of their officials. Uh, and it's relentless, the civil service training. And you see this around the world, the patriotic chain, train, chaining. But you know, and a great example is when communist systems broke up, the indoctrination of the communist education system, the worldview, uh, at least among young people, that thing just shattered like glass when they got independent. So I, I, I think that the civic education thing is certainly won't, <coughs> it's certainly symbolically important for people to emphasize values. But I think it's, uh, if somebody said to me, you know, we want to institute a civil, civil service training system or an educational system in our high schools and grade schools, which talks about fighting corruption and being good citizens. I guess I don't think it's going to hurt anything, but I'm just not sure that that yeah. is, uh, is going to make a fundamental difference to a country. Well, based on the empirical data, maybe you are correct, but for Jamaica, I think that such a program is necessary. When there are young boys who are saying that they want to become gunmen, Clearly, you need a new curriculum. So in Jamaica, the situation is a bit different. It's worse. So mm -hmm. you actually need to teach basic values and manners. Mm -hmm. The way I look at it is when you have a new leader, it's important for that leader to declare her or his values in ways that are visible and somewhat costly, and then to go on to structural reforms that make a difference. So an example is... Uh, in my book, Controlling Corruption, I have a case study of a tax commissioner who came in under Ferdinand Marcos. Marcos wanted to clean up the tax system cynically so he could take a little more of the benefits, at least politically, for having more public spending. And he brought in a chief justice of a Supreme Court uh, to be the head of the tax system and only, only told him one thing, don't go after my wife's family. <laughs> but this guy then started things like mass, you know, Catholic mass every morning at the tax bureau. He had a monthly newsletter which emphasized the heroes who were doing good things and that uh, he relentlessly went around the country and uh, found bright spots which were consistent with value statements. But his real contribution, in my opinion, doing the case study and talking with him as I was doing the case study, was changing these structural things I talked about earlier about the monopoly plus discretion minus accountability, going after some big fish, uh, some big tax collectors and some big bribers and making those cases public and getting them out there to show people that he was serious, not just words, in other words, not just nice speeches, but actual big fish getting fried. This changed the perceptions of impunity and then led to unprecedented uh, progress in the tax system. I'll tell you a quick anecdote about that though. I went back, this was in the 1980s he did this. I went back uh, 20 years later in the Philippines as it was transitioning to Benigno Aquino III and I, I was asked to give a talk at the tax bureau. And I said, congratulations, uh, you're, you know, your case study of success is studied all over the world now. And they said, what case study? <laughs> and literally the tax director nor his staff had any idea of this. And they were once again, riven with corruption. 
I, I, I like what you're saying, Robert. Enforcement is seminal. So in Jamaica, there's an organization, the Auditor General's Department, and year after year, fanciful reports are published giving a detailed description of corruption, but people are not being arrested. So the agency needs, needs to prosecute. That's a problem. Enforcement is crucial. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so if you're just highlighting corruption, but you fail to prosecute, that's laughable. People are just going to think you're a joke. And this is that's right. a big problem in Jamaica. Many institutions, many laws, but a paucity of enforcement. However, Robert, to, well, you yes. may go ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just thinking, may I close with a comment about culture and corruption? Yes, you may close with a comment on culture and with corruption. Some practice, with some practice. I have to go in a few minutes. So let me, let me give you an example. So with the case of corruption and culture, you'll see in the book, uh, The Culture and Development Manifesto, I have a chapter about that. And you'll see that the, the enemy, in a way, is the idea that these cultural variables, which are correlated with corruption, somehow mean we can do nothing about it. <clears throat> so in these talks I've been giving in Latin America this last uh, month or so, I talked about three definitions, three kinds of cultures of corruption that have nothing to do with colonial history, language, religion, individualism, and so forth. They're different. And the first one is a cynicism, a culture of cynicism where exactly what you talked about happens. There are beautiful laws, beautiful rules, and they're not enforced. Or there's lockdowns about uh, COVID, and then we have parties in the prime minister's house. You know, nobody wears a mask. And when people see this impunity, this breeds a deep cynicism, not only about this particular ruler or this particular law, but about government in general. And this is where distrust that you talked about is a crucial variable becomes greater in, in these times of impunity. So what can we do about the, the cynicism problem and the de defeatism problem as a cultural, uh, I am arguing that's a cultural feature, not in the sense of a deep culture, but it's a, it's a, moment, it's a momentary or it's a possibly ephemeral a thing. Now, what do we do about the antidote to cynicism is success. Once you show a success, People no longer say, well, that can't be done. That could never happen here. And an example of success is when you fry some big fish. So almost every case of successful, what I mean by successful is improvement in anti-corruption policies around the world begins with some big fish going down. All and right. not, just in the, not just in the opposition party, but in your own party. So that's, let me just give two more quick examples. No, uh, Robert, second, Robert, here, Robert, sorry. I, 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 I'll have to cut you because... You said a okay. few minutes, but before we wrap up, I just wanted you to wanted you to speak briefly. A yes or no question. Geography, climate, and genes in development studies. Is there a relationship between genes and development? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because and I will encourage people to read your paper. Yeah. You said you said yes or no, so I'll say yes. Yeah, yes. All right then. Okay. Well, thank you for your interview. I wish you luck down there. And maybe you can edit it down to get rid of the ums and as and ahs and uh, let me know how it looks. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.